Bonjour, agus chia div. Welcome to The Irish in Canada, the podcast exploring the histories and legacies of Irish immigrants and their Canadian descendants. I'm your host, Jane McGaughy. This is episode number seven, The Shiners. A word of warning, this episode includes descriptions of sexual assault and violence that may be disturbing to some listeners. In 1534, when the French explorer Jacques Cartier first saw the dark forests on the north shore of the Gulf of St. Lawrence, he described them as the land God gave to Cain. It was a reference to Adam and Eve's oldest son in the book of Genesis, the world's first murderer, and the cursed land to which Cain was banished after killing his brother Abel. I don't know if any of the Shiners knew Cartier's quote, but they certainly tried to live up to it. Through much of the 1830s, a gang of vicious Irish Catholic lumberjacks called the Shiners caused terror and mayhem along the Ottawa River. Their leader, Peter Aylin, rose to the heights of economic and social power in the region through violence, intimidation, arson, and worse. People from all classes and backgrounds were insulted, roughly handled, brutally beaten, raped, and murdered by members of the Shiners, who claimed dominance of both the timber trade and the Ottawa Valley. Only a few hundred men ever became part of the Shiner Brotherhood, but their impact on early Bytown society was undeniable. Their reign of terror has since become known as the Shiners' War. The Ottawa Valley has a long history of Irishness. The valley includes several major rivers that empty into the Ottawa, with heavily forested hills, over 900 lakes, and the granite bedrock of the Canadian Shield. Counties like Carleton and Pontiac had 70% Irish populations in the 19th century. By comparison, Toronto and Boston never had more than 25%. Many of the Irish had arrived to build the Rideau Canal, Once it was finished in 1832, the majority transitioned to become farmers in the area around Bytown, the city we now call Ottawa. Others chose a different kind of employment, taking up work in the woods as part of the lucrative timber trade. And some of those men began to work for Peter Aylin. For those of you familiar with Canada's national capital region, it might be a bit difficult for you to imagine Ottawa as one of the most dangerous places in North America. But in the 1830s, it was the Wild West. And after you hear the stories I'm about to tell you, you might wonder how we ever forgot about the Shiners and what they did. Early Bytown was an isolated frontier outpost centered on industry and profit, It didn't have anywhere near the number of settlers as the St. Lawrence River or Lake Ontario. The timber kings and lumber barons of the Ottawa Valley, the Gatineau, and Pontiac often hired their own countrymen to work in the forest. Peter Aylin wasn't alone in preferring to hire Irishmen for his timber business, but he was more willing than the others to indulge in the worst, violent Irish stereotypes in order to take control of the area. He promised his workers jobs, housing, and victory over their French-Canadian rivals. Under his direction, the Shiners raided French timber camps, destroyed their booms and rafts, attacked rival crews, and intimidated any local businessman who tried to oppose them. The one lumberjack who did stand against them, Joseph Montferrand, became a folk hero in French Canada. The Shiners were not remembered so fondly. We don't know why they use the name Shiners, and it's Shiners, not Shriners. This is not a story about the Masons who build hospitals. It's possible that Shiner is a corruption of the French Chaineur, a cutter of oak trees. And my students often ask if it's because they gave so many people black eyes. Whatever the origin of the name, The Shiners were the wild Irish brought to life. According to the Bytown Gazette, the Shiners' war occurred when certain Irishmen, quote, 
uncontrolled by law and unrestrained by conscience or moral feeling, let loose, becoming an ungovernable rabble, indulging their brutal passions and gratifying their beastly lusts almost at will. End quote. The people of Bytown were powerless to restrain the Shiners' quote, fierce passions, their inhuman acts, or their accused abominations. End quote. They didn't even have a jail in town. Newspapers wrote about the Shiners as an almost demonic, frightening presence in the Ottawa Valley. Their key targets were French Canadians, Orangemen, and the establishment. Unlike canal workers, the Shiners did not live with their wives and children, if they had any. Instead, they existed in an all-male, hyper-masculinized world focused on class conflict. Tales of what the Shiners did to their victims became the stuff of nightmares. Hardly a night could be passed, reported the Bytown Gazette, without the slumbers of some portion of the community being disturbed by cries of distress and the sickening sound caused by their bludgeons on a human body. And not unfrequently would the cry of murder be heard from different quarters half a dozen times during the course of a night. One story had the shiner Martin Hennessy being killed by a blow to the head from a poker while, quote, attempting to roast a fellow mortal, unquote. Women were attacked in the snow and beaten for fun. Horses had their tails and ears cut off. The Shiners made being Irish along the Ottawa River something dangerous and malevolent. It was enticing for those who wanted to join Peter Allen's workers, but terrifying for those who wanted to be left alone. These were not men to be tangled with. To solidify his men's loyalty to him, Allen rewarded them with food, alcohol, and women when the Shiners were in town. Women at the debauches Aylan organized were given enough alcohol to make them quickly drunk, and then stripped and laid out in public, surrounded by candles to completely expose their nudity. The Shiners would, quote, indulge themselves in acts of brutality and blasphemy sufficient to horrify any but the most depraved and abandoned villain, end quote. Many women were raped by the Shiners, but not many Shiners were ever prosecuted for their crimes. From September to June, the Shiners lived in the forest, cutting and hauling logs. They slept in temporary shanties, where they drank a lot of rum, and had very little interaction with the outside world. But without any women around, the colonial authorities soon became nervous about just what the Shiners were doing in the backwoods. In 1835, Samuel Revens, co-founder of the Montreal Daily Advertiser, testified in London to the Select Committee on Timber Duties about the Shiners' depravity. Pressed for details by the committee, he said that the Shiners were prone to, quote, drunkenness and brutality and were placed beyond the good social effects consequent upon being surrounded by women and the responsibility of being subjected to the laws of the country, end quote. There was marked disapproval of men performing women's roles, like cooking or washing, but there might have been some other worries hidden in the subtext. Were imperial authorities concerned that the Shiner's world included men having sex with each other? Similar fears of same-sex relations had been voiced about Australian bushrangers and stockmen, Testifying to the Select Committee on Transportation in 1838, Father William Ullathorne referred to acts of sodomy committed on prison ships bound for New South Wales and in the Australian outback. Quote, I believe and am convinced that wherever a number of bad men are brought together and continue together for any length of time and are crowded together, there is a very great deal of that crime. End quote. The lack of women on the imperial frontier prompted fears of sex among men who spent long periods of time alone together. Unfortunately, there is no smoking gun here. There are no letters or diaries from Shiners discussing what happened in their camps in the woods. All we have are the newspaper reports 
and letters of concern from people in Bytown about what happened when the Shiners arrived there in the off-season. But that silence shouldn't be surprising. The sociologist Ari Adit has argued that the scandal of sodomy in the public sphere would have been much more damning than any sexual acts in and of themselves. Talking about men having sex with men would have made it real. It was much easier for the colonial authorities to pretend anything like that simply didn't happen. At least, not in Canada. By the beginning of 1837, it was felt something had to change or Bytown would be completely overrun by Aelin and his men. But what did change the balance against the Shiners wasn't their attacks on women or French-Canadian lumberjacks, but because they dared to attack the upper classes in local society. Once the respectable citizens of Bytown were in danger, the establishment finally acted. There were financial concerns that the scandalous behavior of the Irish lumberjacks was ruining Bytown's reputation within the timber industry, which, in turn, could affect imperial trade. The problem, however, with trying to stop the Shiners was that Bytown had no jail and no police force. The Shiners' War occurred 40 years before the Mounties came about, and most cities and towns had no civil means to control their populations. There were British troops in the Canadas, but Bytown was not Montreal or Toronto. Soldiers could be deployed to stop rioting or unrest, but Lieutenant Governor Sir Francis Bondhead, our old friend from the episode on James Fitzgibbon, pointedly refused to involve the military in the Shiners' War. He refused every petition he received from the people of Bytown for aid. What ended the Shiners' control over the Ottawa Valley was when Peter Aylin set his men against James Johnston, a Bytown merchant, newspaper owner, and an Irish-born orangeman who publicly criticized Aylin. There were many attacks made on Johnston's home, and then he himself was cornered by three Shiners on a bridge over the Rideau Canal in late March 1837. He escaped by jumping over the side and landing in a deep snowdrift about 12 feet below. The Shiners then shot at him from above, attacked him with a whip, and tried to crush him with a large stone. When Johnston was finally rescued by onlookers, he had two skull fractures. After this attack, the magistrates in town formed armed patrols and swore in special constables to arrest the Shiners when they appeared in town. This caused the gang to slowly break apart. Johnston's attackers were some of the few to receive actual prison sentences, and that also appeared to affect the gang's sense of power in the region. Within a matter of weeks, the Shiners went from being the colony's violent boogeymen to an ineffectual group of unemployed lumberjacks. Peter Aylin had escaped to Lower Canada to avoid arrest, leaving his men to their own devices. The Shiners' war ended with a definite whimper rather than a bang. The Shiners were remembered now and then, but for the most part, Bytown moved on. It was reborn in 1867 as the capital city of Ottawa in the Dominion of Canada. According to the Globe newspaper, it changed from one of the wildest and most lawless places on the continent to one of the most beautiful and peaceable. Soon, it would be hard to imagine Ottawa's earlier days of brutality and mayhem. Few people outside of Ottawa have ever heard of the Shiners, which is something of a surprise if you think of how popular comparable 19th century Irish outlaws have been, like Australia's Ned Kelly or the Molly Maguires. The Shiners well deserved being called the Wild Irish, but they don't fit within an image of Canada as a nice and peaceful place. Violent Irishmen did exist in the Canadian colonies. They included politicians, soldiers, and journalists, as well as murderers, vigilantes, rioters, arsonists, and rapists. They were feared and vilified, and in some cases, elected to public office. Despite his vicious past and the atrocities committed in his name, Peter Aylin ended his days 
as an alderman, a justice of the peace, and a philanthropist in the town of Aylmer, Quebec. Next time, on The Irish in Canada, we'll take a look at a project dear to my heart that explores the history of famine-era Irish immigrants locked away in Canadian lunatic asylums. Thanks for listening to The Irish in Canada. The show was researched, written, and narrated by me, Jane McGaughy. This season was edited and mixed by Patrick McMaster and produced by Marion Mulvenna. Our theme music was composed and performed by Kate Bevan Baker, and our logo was designed by Claire McCauley. Many thanks to the School of Irish Studies at Concordia University in Montreal, the Canadian Irish Studies Foundation, Le Gouvernement de Québec, and the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada for their support. If you like the show, please subscribe, rate, and review us on your favourite podcast app. You can spread the word about the Irish in Canada by following us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at Irish Canada Pod. Our website is is the Irish in Canada podcast.ca. That's where you can find show notes for our episodes, including lists of sources and recommendations for further reading. Until next time, Gora Maogif. <laughs>